What's going on folks? Ted from Nerd Immersion here, and I'm finally getting around to finishing my Wild Beyond the Witchlight coverage. For those of you who are unsure of what I'm talking about, I've been covering basically all the new things in Wild Beyond the Witchlight, and the last thing left is new monsters. Now I've already covered the NPC factions that were included, the three kind of main factions of NPCs, and we're going to cover every other monster in the book. But I did want to say I'm doing this because Fizban's Treasury of Dragons officially launches on the 26th, which is this coming Tuesday. I'm recording this on the 24th. So at that point, I'll be starting my Fizban's coverage. Um, but I'm also receiving a package from Wizards of the Coast on the 25th. Now, I don't actually know what that is. For all I know, that could be an early review copy of Strixhaven Curriculum of Chaos. If that is the case, I will be doing a live stream Monday night where I'll answer all of your questions about anything contained in that book. If it's something else, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. But I did want to say if you enjoy these the shorts videos I've been doing, news coverage, coverage like this, theoretical concepts, D&D story times, I have a couple of those queued up for the coming week, uh, consider subscribing to the channel. It's a simple click for you guys. It does immense amounts of things for me. So uh, one of the reasons that it's took long to do this, and I should say this now, buckle up folks, this is going to be a long video because there are a lot. And the reason I say that is because if you were to go to uh, Wild Beyond the Witchlight, let's say so we were to go here and pull up Wild Beyond the Witchlight, or you look in your book, you'll say, oh, there's a section called Appendix C, Creatures. And if you look, this is all of the creatures listed. Now, I'm not zoomed in yet, but that's not really important. You could just tell this is a short list. Here's the problem. Several creatures have their stat blocks sprinkled throughout the adventure. Only some of them include stat blocks here in Appendix C. So what we're going to do is instead of going just in sorting by Appendix C, which would have been a much faster, much quicker video, uh, we are going to go here to the monster section of D&D Beyond and sort everything by source category Wild Beyond the Witchlight. That will give us the opportunity to see everything and then also to filter things out. Now I should say there are some creatures that are reprinted here in Wild Beyond the Witchlight. For example, we can see right off the top, Boggle and Bullywug. Bullywugs were in the monster manual. The Boggles were in Volo's Guide to Monsters. We're not going to cover those here, although they technically will have updated stat blocks in theory here to be more in line with what we'll see in Morden Kanan's Monsters of the Multiverse coming later in uh, January, and then the future reprintings of the Monster Manual. We're going to focus on creatures that solely are sourced from Wild Beyond the Witchlight. This will also un unfortunately include those NPCs that we covered in the NPC Factions video, but we're going to exclude those. When we get to them, we'll just click away because we won't look at them. But we're going to start right off the top with Agden Longscarf, and I do want to open these in a separate window because some of them do have art. Uh, he is a Harangon, a chaotic evil Harangon, uh, but this is more of an NPC than a character, but they weren't included in the NPC faction section of the book, and they weren't included in the monster section, the creature section. They were just kind of in there in the middle. Now this is an NPC that you will encounter, and you can see we do have some role-playing notes, ideas, bonds, traits, and flaws, but for more or less this is just kind of a, a lower level NPC that we can see here. A Harangon NPC, a challenge rating of 2, does have access to evasion. The Harangon's standing kind of leap ability. Actually, I don't know if a Harangon has standing leap like this, but this one does. Um, got a couple of proficiencies. Uh, does have a 70 foot movement speed while he's wearing his scarf. Uh, and then we can see here he's got a two attacks with a branding iron or a dagger. Now, branding iron is not a weapon we've seen before in Wild Beyond the Witchlight, or sorry, in 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons, but it appears to just deal fire damage, 3d6 fire damage, and the target is magically branded. Agden is invisible to creatures branded in this way. The brand disappears after 24 hours or removed from a creature by or an object by something uh, that removes a curse, for example, a remove curse spell. She has a regular old dagger attack and then has quick fingers, the bonus action. Uh, targets one creature within five feet of him and uh, makes a dexterity sleight of hand check with a DC equal to one plus the target's passive perception. On a successful check, he pilfers one object weighing one pound or less from them. So this is almost sort of like a, a thief rogue's ability, but it just happens to be called quick fingers and then also has uncanny dodge as a reaction. Now, unfortunately, from what I can tell here, uh, it says here that his scarf is a blue length of cloth that uh, he claims was woven from lightning bolts, 
uh, that he stole from a dark cloud. It can't be removed, even if he dies. His branding iron functions for him alone, and it ceases to be hot when it leaves his hand. So unfortunately, you won't be able to steal the scarf that gives him a 70-foot movement speed or use his cool branding iron. It's usable only by him. But that's a cool new item, uh, items and weapons that we get to see, at least when we encounter this particular NPC. Next up is Algarthas, another NPC. This is an elf NPC. No unique art here, um, but we can see he's just a challenge rating 3. His advantage on saving throws against being frightened, fey ancestry as elves tend to do. Two melee attacks, uh, an unarmed strike that just does four bludgeoning damage, and then also has an action for called what's called leadership. For one minute, he can utter a special command or a, no or a warning whenever a non-hostile creature that it can see is within 30 feet, makes an attack roll or saving throw. They can add a D the creature can add a D4 to its roll provided it can hear and understand him. A creature can only benefit from one leadership die at a time. So this is sort of like a bless, sort of like a bardic inspiration. It is an action, though, to do so, uh, but it, it lasts for a minute, and they can utter this command that that creature can then, again, use it on attack, ro attack rolls or saving throws. Um, but they can do this, again, for that full minute, but they can only benefit from it one at a time. Uh, so nothing too crazy here, but again, I will always say these are NPCs that you can draw from to use in your own game if you so uh, so choose to do so. And then again, you can always pilfer abilities like leadership and put them on other NPCs if you wish to use them in your own game. Okay, moving on. Uh, we meant to open that in. So we have Amador the Dandelion, which is a pretty cool character that does have unique art. So uh, it's a literal living dandelion, which is, again, something really cool that is not included in that creature section. So is a small plant creature, uh, can speak with plants and beasts, uh, has a rapier that actually does a D8 plus 2, even though it's a challenge rating one half creature. Seed sling as well, a ranged attack that does a D4 plus 2 bludgeoning, and also has the parry ability. Uh, it's just immensely adorable and cute. Uh, it can only speak, it can actually speak common and sylvan, so it can talk to you. And this could be a really fun character. I mean, look it. He's got strength, dexterity, constitution, and wisdom saving throw proficiencies, and proficiency in perception, persuasion, and stealth. This is a really cool character, and once again, if you don't flip through the book, you will just miss out on this character existing. All right, moving on. We have, uh, we have, we already covered this. This is one of the hags. We have the boggle we have already covered. So a Briganok here is a new fey creature, which you can see here is kind of uh, mouse-ish, I guess you could say, mole-like in nature. Um, anyway, we'll zoom in a little bit so we don't get yelled at for people who watch on mobile. Uh, this is fey ancestry. Uh, soul light, it is accompanied by an insubstantial and vulnerable ball of light that contains its soul. It can't turn off the light or control its brightness. It sheds bright light in 10 foot radius and dim in another 10 feet. If it dies, the soul fades away. It has tunneler. It can use a pickaxe or similar tool. It can burrow through solid rock at a speed of five feet, leaving a six inch diameter tunnel in its wake. It has its pickaxe for an attack. It has a spell casting, which is minor illusion, spare the dying at will and once a day of animal friendship, fairy fire, meld stone, and silence. And it also has the time lapse ability, which recharges on a short or long rest. It accelerates the passage of time around itself, enabling it to accomplish up to one hour of work in a matter of seconds. Uh, this can't affect any creature other than the Briganok or any object being worn or carried by another creature, and the activity must take place within a 10-foot cube. For example, the Briganok could use an action to rapidly carve a pumpkin, cook and eat dinner, remove a pile of stones, or tie a dozen knots in a length of rope. And then lastly, as a bonus action, we have the moving of the soul light. It moves it up to 30 feet in any direction. At the end of its turn, the light returns to the Briganok. And we can see a frantic mouse-sized creature that lives in mines. Whenever a mortal makes a non-magical wish, perhaps while blowing out the candles on a birthday cake or tossing a coin down a well, an echo of that wish becomes lodged in a stone buried deep in the earth of the Feywild. It's pretty cool lore there. Briganox seek out those wish stones. All right, moving on to our next one. We have the Bullywug, which we're going to skip. The Bullywug Knight is technically a new creature, so we will go ahead and pull that up. It also has some pretty, uh, I think, very funny-looking art here of this sort of bullywug in armor. Um, nothing too crazy, though. It has more or less standard bullywug stuff, as we can see here. Amphibious 
Uh, the knight can communicate with frogs and toads and has the standing leap ability. It does wield a glaive, as we can see here, which does a d10 plus three, and has croak of charming that recharges on a short or a long rest. It makes a loud croak while targeting one creature within 30 feet. They must make a wisdom saving throw or be charmed by the bullywog knight until the end of its next turn. It also does have constitution and wisdom saving throw profici proficiency, and it's a challenge rating three creature that uh, wears plate mail. So I thought that was a pretty interesting little character. I like that a lot. Uh, moving on, we have the Bullywug Royal, which is from Ghost of Salt March, so we'll skip that. We have the Campestry, which we've seen uh, or heard of before uh, in some early promo stuff, which is basically a singing mushroom. As you can see here is a challenge rating zero. As Tremor sends out to 30 feet, can mimic any voice or song it's heard, albeit in a nasally falsetto voice. Uh, it has a headbutt attack with a uh, five foot range that does one bludgeoning damage and can issue spores once a day. Um, five foot radius of spores extends from it. The creature uh, spores can go around corners but have no effect on constructs, elementals, plants, or undead. Each creature in the area must make a DC 10 wisdom saving throw. On a failure, they are incapacitated. Their speed is halved, uh, and both it says. The creature is incapacitated and its speed is halved, both for one minute. Gotcha. The creature can repeat this saving throw at the end of each of its turn, ending the effect on a success. And I have to remember, going to look up over here on a secondary monitor, was this one of the things that was listed in the creature section? Um, I can't remember if it was one of the few. It was, okay, so. All right, Campestry, uh, the singing happy-go-lucky mushroom. All right, then we have Clapper Claw the Scarecrow which again, a character that would not be covered in the back of the book. Um, as we can see here is a scarecrow with lobster claws. Um, created uh, by one of the hags using a tormented child's soul, uh, it ran from home so it wouldn't have to perform evil tasks for her. So we do have some role-playing notes on it. Is a challenge rating one half, is a construct, vulnerable to fire, immune to poison, typical scarecrow stuff. Uh, doesn't require air, food, drink, or sleep, and has these claws that do 2d4 plus 2 damage, and it has a move, an action called Stuffing. Uh, it's uh, Clapper Claw uh, stuffs straw or another dead plant matter into itself. It regains 2d4 plus 2 hit points. On a roll of a, a roll of d6, on a 1 or a 2, it runs out of stuffing and must spend 8 hours foraging for more before it can use this action again. Then as a bonus action, it has Unsettling Presence. It targets a creature within 15 feet. They must make a wisdom saving throw or be magically frightened. I don't remember seeing magically frightened as something specific that we've seen called out, but or be magically frightened until the end of Clapper Claw's next turn, which is just a really cool, funny NPC that, again, you would not find in the back of the book. Darklings and Darkling Elders, again, both contained in Volo's Guide to Monsters. However, the Displacer Beast Kitten is new. Also something, again, not found in the back of the book. Uh, which is just absolutely adorable. I mean, look at this art. How can you not fall in love with that? Challenge rating 1 8. It does have the displacement ability that displacer beasts are known to have um, and has a uh, plus 3 to hit for its tentacles that do 2 bludgeoning damage plus 2 piercing damage. It's adorable. It's challenge rating 1 8. Um, this, in theory, I, I, you know, potentially were you to come across this, I, I would make the argument you could possibly get one of these as a familiar. Um, I don't see any downside to that. We have uh, Elkhorn the Dwarf, I believe, is from Valor's Call. He is. So is Endolin Moongrave. She is one of the hags. So then we can move on to Envy, uh, the Iron Lion. So again, is also not one of the creatures in the back of the book. Envy, as you can see here, is this awesome looking iron creature. Uh, is it one of two guardians that Zabilna created to watch over her garden in her absence? Um, and we can see here, this is a monstrosity. I would have thought more of a construct, but is a monstrosity. Uh, is immune to petrification. Uh, it, this, if Envoy moves at least 20 feet, uh, we'll, we'll get to Envoy in a second there, but, or sorry, if Envy, rather, I said Envoy, rather. If Envy moves at least 20 feet towards a creature and hits it with a bite attack on the same turn, they must make a DC 16 strength saving throw or be knocked prone. If the target is prone, you can make a uh, one attack with its claws, again, as a bonus action. This is typical lion-style stuff. Uh, bite attack that does 2d12 plus 5 piercing damage. That's a pretty sizable amount of damage. And the claws do 2d10 plus 5. And then also similar to, like, a gorgon-style creature, has petrifying breath on a recharge of 5 to 6, a 30-foot cone. DC 13 con save on a failure. You start turning to stone and are restrained. 
You must repeat the saving throw at the end of each of your turns. On a success, it ends. On a failure, you are petrified until freed by the Greater Restoration spell or other magic. That's a pretty cool creature. I like that a lot. Um, okay. Then we have a Fairy Dragon. We've seen those already. We have, I think we've talked about this one before, but the Flying Rocking Horse um, was alluded to in one of the Hag's stat blocks here, but here it actually is. Uh, a Construct Challenge Rating 1 8th. Typical construct immunities. Looks like a normal rocking horse when it's not moving, uh, but is a flying mount. It can serve as a mount for a medium or smaller creature that can fly only while mounted. This is also an interesting thing where we've seen it is a medium creature, but it can also serve as a mount for a medium creature. Um, it doesn't require air, food, drink, or sleep, and regains no hit points or hit dice at the end of a long rest, and has a simple headbutt attack for a d6 bludgeoning damage. All right, we have gone through page one of the monsters on this book. Let us keep going. For Morian, Galeb Durr, those are all contained in the Monster Manual. We do have a nice new beast that we can use if we uh, are a druid or something otherwise. A giant dragonfly that you can see right here. A My dog is barking in the background. A uh, large beast that is unaligned, uh, as beasts typically are. It has a uh, large size, so that does mean you can ride on it as a medium creature. Has the drone ability. When it beats its wings, it emits a loud droning noise that can be heard out to 120 feet. If you've ever been around a dragonfly in real life, when they buzz by you, they make a lot of noise. So I could only imagine one the size of a horse, what that would sound like. And it does have a small bite attack for a d4 plus 4 piercing damage, and also has uncanny dodge, like a rogue. So this is pretty interesting. I like the art as well. We can see somebody riding on the large dragonfly. This could be a fun, uh, it's only a challenge rating one half as well, and it does have a 60 foot movement speed. So this could actually be, and a 16 AC, so not too bad, 18 decks. So this could be a pretty decent form for a druid, or possibly if you're able to summon different creatures of your choice, dra giant dragonfly. Uh, one might be a really fun thematic thing, depending on what kind of summoner or creature you are, right? If you're a druid and you kind of theme things around insects, perhaps summoning a giant dragonfly is better than, say, summoning a giant eagle or the like. Uh, and then if we move on, we also have a giant snail, which, again, another beast that we can use here. Uh, we can see here's an art of it as well. Uh, challenge rating one quarter, also large size. Has salt osmosis. Whenever the snail starts its turn in contact with a pound or more of salt, takes a d4 necrotic damage. Using an action to sprinkle a pound of salt on a snail deals uh, 1d4 necrotic damage to it immediately, and another d4 necrotic damage to it at the end of its next turn, after which the salt rubs off, provided the snail is not withdrawn into its shell. And it has a slam attack that does a d6 plus 2 bludgeoning damage, and a shell defense similar to the turtle, where it withdraws into its shell to get a plus 4 AC, and it can choose to emerge as a bonus action. Uh, nothing too crazy. It fits, again, maybe if it's thematic, I don't know. But uh, giant snails, uh, they're cool that we have another stat block. Probably not the most practical uh, for in-play use. Once again, we have a giant swan, another giant creature to use, potentially as a druid. Challenge rating one, uh, keen sight, so advantage on perception checks that rely on sight. And then it makes, has multi-attack uh, with a beak attack that does a d6 plus 3 piercing damage. Does also happen to have an 80-foot fly speed. Once again, not contained in the back, although giant dragonfly and giant snail were. Giant swan easily looked over. Okay, we have the glass pegasus construct. Doesn't look like we have anything else to click on, so we don't have any art, so I'll keep it here. But... Uh, we have uh, 15 while animated and AC uh, 13 otherwise. Uh, you know what? I'm going to open it just in case there's more to this stat block and we're missing out. Oh, doesn't look like it at all. All right. Condition immunities, uh, plus six perception checks, and similar to a Pegasus, Dex, Wisdom, and Charisma saving throws has hoof attacks that do 2d6 plus four bludgeoning damage and a challenge rating two creature. Again, uh, this was probably contained somewhere in the book and provides us the information as to why a glass Pegasus is here and how it can be animated, but either way, a cool stat block nonetheless. We have a glasswork golem. This one we will open as it does have artwork. Uh, funnily enough, also something not contained in the back of the book. So it looks to be any other golem. You can see it has damage immunities and condition immunities as you would normally have. Dexterity, constitution, wisdom, saving throw, false appearance to basically look like a stained glass window until it eventually makes its move. Uh, immutable form, as golems typically have, and also has an unusual nature like golems have. 
but it does have regeneration. Regens 10 hit points at the start of each of its turns, unless it takes bludgeoning or thunder damage, as it is made of glass. That kind of makes sense. Uh, and then it has multi-attack, two glass sword attacks, which aren't anything crazy, just a D8 plus one slashing damage. And then has a dazzling light ability as a bonus action that recharges on a 5-6, which is a cone of magical light that's a 15-foot cone. Each creature in it must make a DC 10 con save or be blinded for a minute, and they can make that save again at the end of their turns. This is actually pretty solid for a challenge rating 2 creature. I like it a lot, and I think the artwork's pretty sweet. Uh, we have Gloam here, moving on, which is an undead. Uh, I don't see anything too crazy about this character, uh, but we'll go ahead and open it up just to make sure there's nothing or there's no real lore about it. Um, challenge rating zero, advantage on perception checks that rely on smell. Uh, claws that do just one slashing damage and then can do a cloud of dust. On the first turn in any combat or when it's reduced to zero hit points, the cat expels a cloud of dust that acts as dust of sneezing and choking. So it's basically a cat, an undead cat with a dust cloud ability. Um, all right, and immunity to poison uh, and exhaustion in the poisoned condition. Goblin boss and the gray slot are contained in uh, Monster Manual. We have a Heron Gone Brigand, which again is just kind of an NPC. Uh, you know, again, uh, basically like a rogue here, as we can see. Uh, pack tactics and standing leap, a club attack, and a sling. Nothing too, too crazy on this particular character. And then again, following suit here, we also have the Heron Gone Sniper, uh, which is going to be challenge rating one quarter. Once again, standing leap and club, but does have a light crossbow, uh, which has uh, just a, a range of 320 feet. No, no, uh, no different there. Just maximum range of 320. Does a D8 plus three piercing damage, and it says hit or miss immediately after making this attack. The Heron Gone can use the hide action again, benefiting the sniper uh, idea. And I also like that ability. Uh, we'll open it up just to see if there's anything else, but. Hit or miss is actually really cool. I feel like this should be maybe like highlighted separately, but this could be something again for folks who want to make sniper builds or sniper style weapons for their game. This would be something you could employ easily enough that immediately after making an attack with this weapon or however it works, uh, they can use the hide action, uh, which is pretty sweet. And that is not a bonus action or an action. It is just a function of the attack. All right, now we didn't actually have Igwilv the Witch Queen in any of the other ones. So we actually do have stat blocks for uh, for Tasha as Igwil. So we can go ahead and pull this one up. This is a pretty lengthy stat block, so bear with me here. And we can see her art is right here. And she is a challenge rating 20 Fey wizard. Uh, and we can see she has intelligence, wisdom, charisma, saving throws. She also is wearing a robe of the Arch Magi. Uh, immunity, charmed, and frightened has true sight out to 60 feet. Uh, is immune to any effect that would age her, and she can't die from old age, has three legendary resistances, has magical resistance, and again, wears an amulet of the plains and a robe of the Arch Magi. She can make two bewitching bolt attacks uh, as a part of her multi-attack action, which is plus 16 to hit, and has this other unique new thing we've started to see of this, uh, the range can either be melee or, uh, or ranged spell attack, so five feet or 120, does 5d6 plus 8 lightning damage, and if they're a creature, they must make a DC 22 wisdom save or be charmed until the start of her next turn. She can also, on a re uh, recharge of 5 or 6, ca uh, do Abyssal Rift, which opens an abyss within 120 feet of her. Uh, it's 20-foot radius sphere. Each creature must make a DC 22 con save or take 98 necrotic damage on a failure, half on a success. Uh, in addition, there's a 50% chance that three Hezros, the demon, uh, or the, yeah, the demons, appear in an unoccupied space within that sphere. They act as her allies, take their turns immediately after hers, uh, but they can't summon additional ones. And they remain until they die, or until she dismisses them. And then you can see her spellcasting action is at will. Detect magic, disguise self, invisibility, light, mage hand, me message, prestidigitation, and Tasha's hideous laughter. Three times per day, Dispel Magic, Fly, Polymorph, and once a day, Maze, Telekinesis, Teleport, and Wish, with a DC of 24 on those, or a plus 16 to hit. She can teleport 30 feet every turn as a bonus action. She can negate a spell as a reaction, which is kind of the opposite, uh, sort of a untyped counterspell, if you will. Uh, she sees a creature within 60 feet of her casting a spell. She tries to interrupt that spell. If the creature casting the spell uh, using a spell slot of 8th level or lower, it fails. Which is interesting because even if... So if it's an 8th level or lower spell, immediately ends. 
but if the person casting is casting a ninth level spell, then the caster needs to make an intelligence saving throw of DC 22. And again, this can't be, this negate spell can't be counterspelled because it's not a spell. She also has three legendary actions. Uh, one, she can use either a spell casting spell or face step. Two, she can do dark speech. Uh, she utters a phrase in a forbidden language and one or two creatures uh, within 60 feet of her must make a wisdom save or take 2d10 psychic damage and be frightened of her for a minute. They can repeat the save at the end of their turns or three to cast Fey Beleaguerment, or sorry, Beguilement rather. Uh, targets one creature within 60 feet. They must make a DC 22 charisma save or be possessed by a Fey spirit. While possessed, they must obey her commands and they can repeat the saving throw again at the end of their turns. She also has a couple other things here. It says Baba Yaga's daughter. Um, she, uh, oh, this is just telling us about her, the inventor of Tasha's Hideous Laughter. Uh, she wrote the Demonomicon of Igwilv. Uh, and then they talk a little bit about the Igwilv transformation. She learned several dark secrets while studying the Abyss, including the ability to summon demons and demonic spirits. But uh, she underwent this quest and underestimated it, and then it transformed her from basically Tasha into Igwilv, and then we can see again some role-playing notes for her. And probably my favorite creature in here, which I think is one of the best ones, it also happens to also be a dragon, is the Jabberwock. It has the art style that we're kind of come to know, and it is a challenge rating 13 dragon with a climb speed, fly speed, swim speed, proficiency in every saving throw, uh, vulnerable to slashing from a Vorpal Sword, uh, immunity to poison, charm, frighten, the poison condition, has true sight out to 120 feet, has the confusing bubble ability, uh, it, or sorry, so confusing burble, bubble would be funnier, but confusing burble, uh, it burbles to itself unless it's incapacitated, any creature that starts its turn within 30 feet of the Jabberwock and is able to hear its burbling must make a DC 18 charisma save, on a failure it can't take reactions until the start of its next turn, and it rolls a D4 to determine what it does during its current turn, 1 to 2 does nothing, 3, uh, does nothing except use all of its movement, or four, uh, makes one melee attack against a random creature it can seize, or does nothing if no one is visible within its reach. Three legendary resistances, uh, regeneration of ten hit points a turn, uh, if it takes slashing damage, this doesn't function, um, and then it also has uncanny tracker, it can unerringly track any creature it has wounded in the last 24 hours, and knows the distance and direction to its quarry, as long as they're on the same plane of existence. Uh, on its turn, it can multi-attack two rend attacks with 10-foot reach that do 3d10 plus 5 slashing damage, a tail attack with a 15-foot reach that does a d10 plus 5, or a fiery gaze that recharges on a 5-6. Unless it is blinded, it emits a 120-foot long, 5-foot wide line of fire from its eyes. The creature must make a DC 18 dex save or take 78 fire damage or half on a success. And then three legendary actions, one of which is a tail attack, two for a rend attack, and three for a wing attack, again, similar to a dragon. Beats its wings. Each creature within 10 feet must make a DC 18 dex save or take a D6 plus 5 bludgeoning damage and be knocked prone. All right, moving on from the Jabberwock, we have Jingle Jangle, who is a goblin uh, here, who does have art, so we're going to go ahead and pull open his specific page here. Uh, as you can see here, is a goblinoid. has slightly different style ears, though, more of a like a Feywild sort of goblin, if you will. Uh, but challenge rating one quarter has Nimble Escape, uh, which is a standard goblin ability, and Flail of Locks, which does, uh, as you can see it here, is literally a flail, but instead of a flail, it's made out of locks, which I think is really funny. Does 3d4 bludgeoning damage. Uh, has, obviously, again, stuff. We already covered Kellek. Uh, I don't believe we've covered Kettle Stream. I don't think Kettle Stream was in any of the existing ones, no. So Kettle Stream is uh, the Kenku here. We'll pull up Kettle Stream does have unique art, as we can see here, has sort of like butterfly looking wings on the back. Obviously they're non-functional, but um, Wisdom and Charisma saving throws, uh, challenge rating one, has the um, Kenku's mimicry ability, uh, makes two dagger attacks, nothing crazy there, and has some spell casting at will, disguise self, friends, mage hand, minor illusion. Uh, once a day, bestow curse, fairy fire, speak with animals, and then has twilight sleep twice per day. Targets one creature within 10 feet. The target is engulfed in a cloud of magical sleep-inducing gas. It must make uh, it must succeed on a DC 13 con save or fall unconscious for one minute. A creature put to sleep by this uh, weakens instantly if they take any damage or if someone uses an action to shake them awake. 
Um, Kettle Stream, the Kenku snoops around the carnival. This is interesting, though. Has stolen the voice of a human mime named Candlefoot. Uh, while in this possession, uh, Kettle Stream can speak clearly in Candlefoot's soft, silky voice. Again, typically not a thing that a Kenku can do. Uh, Korids we've already had. Uh, we have the Living Doll, which is something that I think was actually contained in... Yes, this was contained in uh, in the back of the book. I'll, it's been kind of hit or miss on what's there. This is a challenge rating 2 construct. Uh, immunity to poison, paralyzed, petrified, and poison. False appearance, looks like a doll. Regeneration of 5 hit points unless it takes fire or psychic damage. Uh, and obviously doesn't need air, food, drink, or sleep as it is a doll. <laughs> has an action called grabby hands, which I think is pretty funny. Um, it has a five foot reach. The target is grappled. Uh, escape DC is six and takes 2d10 psychic damage at the start of their turns until the grapple ends. You can only grapple one creature at a time. And it can cackle as a bonus action that recharges on a four to six. Targets one or two creatures within 30 feet. Uh, each target that can hear the doll's cackling must make a DC 11 wisdom save. Uh, succeeding automatically if it has an intelligence of four or lower. Uh, and then they take 2d4 psychic damage and are incapacitated for a minute as they're overcome by a fit of laughter. At the end of each of their turns, they can repeat the saving throw. Uh, and that's pretty much it. But I've seen, I wanted to call out that we've seen a lot of this each uh, target one or two creatures within a certain range. That's something relatively new as well. Uh, mains are from the monster manual. Moving on to page three of the monsters here. Uh, Mercyon, we already had uh, her covered in the NPC factions. So here we have uh, Mr. Mr. Light here, uh, which we've seen. These are posed of the two people of the Witchlight Carnival, Mr. Light and Mr. Witch. Uh, Mr. Light is a Shatterkai elf, uh, has vulnerability to lightning damage, resistance to necrotic damage, and uh, blinded, deafened, petrified, and stunned immunity. Fey Ancestry, uh, and then carries the Witch Light Vein, which I, we, we have covered in the past under the Magic Items video. And then could use the Witch Light Vein to do bludgeoning damage and radiant damage with an attack from it. And then has some spell casting while carrying the Witch Light Vein, Dancing Lights, and Polymorph. Uh, but after casting, roll a d8 on a roll of three or eight. You can't use it again until the next dawn and Ray of Frost. And then it has the Blessing of the Raven Queen which is the sort of Shatterkai teleportation that also grants resistance to all damage while doing that. Following that up, we have Mr. Witch, who is also a Shatterkai elf. We will again pull this up so we can see his unique art. Here he is. Uh, uh, necrotic resistance, Fey Ancestry, has the Witch Light Watch, which we've already talked about in the past. Can make two cane attacks that do a D4 plus two bludgeoning damage uh, plus a D12 necrotic. Has some spell casting again from the Witch Light Watch. Firebolt, Invisibility, same thing on a 3 or 8, it doesn't work again. Message, and then once again also has the Blessing of the Raven Queen bonus action ability. Molliver, I believe we covered. I'm just going to check. Molliver is under the yep, Valor's Call. Mud Mephit is contained within the Monster Manual. Paper Bird, I thought I'd seen these in the past, but maybe not. Uh, so it's a tiny construct. Uh, vulnerable to fire, obviously it's made out of paper. Poison Psychic Immunity, and also Charmed, Exhausted, Frightened, Poison uh, Immunity. Uh, advantage on Perception Checks that rely on slight, Sight, and has Sharp Edges, where it can literally give you a paper cut for one slashing damage. Um, and it's just basically Enchanted Parchment that kind of delivers itself. Uh, Peritons are in the Monster Manual. Pixies are in the Monster Manual. Uh, Polinella the Honeybee is unique, though, and has art, so we're going to pull up Polinella's stat block here. Very cute, fuzzy bee art which again is a tiny beast. I know this is a named technically NPC, but if you need B stats, here you go. And has a little sting that does three piercing damage. Uh, we have Quicklings from Volo's Guide. Uh, Razel is from Wild Beyond the Witchlight, and we have not covered them before. So is an elf NPC. Uh, Rogue obviously has Cunning Action, Fey Ancestry, and a 2d6 sneak attack. A bunch of skill proficiencies, as is befitting of a rogue. Short sword and a hand crossbow. Um, and it says the statue is a petrified high off named Razel Uthmar. So obviously if you free them, then they will have these particular stat blocks. Red Cap from Volo's Guide. Ringle Run was in uh, Valor's Call, so covered them. We have the, oh, I want to say Selenellian Twin, uh, which I think I'm pronouncing correct, but I, I really have no concept of that. 
but anyway, Gleam and Glister are high elf twins who, until recently, performed amazing acts of balance and agility at the Witchlight Carnival. Together, they are known as the Selenellian Twins. A Selenellian is a celestial event during a lunar eclipse in which the sun and the eclipse moon can be observed at the same time, either just before sunset or just after sunset when both bodies appear just above the horizon. So as such, they have this sort of cool thing where they're blessed by Corlon, the elven, uh, the elven god, and they can change their sex daily at the end of a long rest. We've seen this in, it was referenced briefly in Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes. It's in like a stat block. Um, and it says they're fond of one another as two siblings can be. Uh, Gleam is the introvert, Glister is the extrovert. But yeah, they're basically kind of two sort of acrobats, and we'll take a look at their abilities here. So they are an elf. As such, they have fey ancestry, but they also do have regeneration. As long as both twins are alive and within 60 feet, they get five hit points a turn. They also have twin bond. Uh, if they're both alive on the same plane of existence. They're aware of each other's emotions. Uh, this reminds me of the, I think it's the Kenra race that was in one of the planescapes. They had the, like the living twin. Um, and they've got a dagger attack, nothing crazy. They have moon ray that Gleam can do three times per day. Uh, which is a range of 60 feet, 2d8 plus 3 radiant damage, and the target must make a DC 13 wisdom saving throw or be transformed into a bat for a minute, as though affected by polymorph. Glister can do a sun ray, which is, uh, again, the same range, same damage, but they must make a DC 13 wisdom save or be blinded for a minute, and then again, for both of those, they can repeat the save at the end of the turn. And then they also have Twin Sight, which recharges after a short or long rest, in her mind's eye, a Selenellian twin can see what the other twin sees for up to a minute, provided they're both alive and on the same plane of existence. It does require concentration, although it does not say that they are blinded while they do so, so I guess they could see what they're seeing, but also see what their twin is seeing? I don't know. Uh, again, this is obviously a very specific situation, these characters, but this could be a fun thing to toy around with in your game, whether it's your player characters or some sort of story plot hook you want to build out. We have a variant shadow here, uh, which I think uh, we're looking right at the start. It looks like the variant here is that it is a fey. Um, as such, it still has vulnerability to radiant damage, has a ton of damage resistances, ass cold, uh, ass, <laughs> acid, cold, fire, lightning, thunder, bludgeoning, piercing, slashing from non-magic, immunity to necrotic and poison, amorphous, it can squeeze through space as, as one inch wide, uh, in dim light or darkness, it can hide as a bonus action, it does have sunlight weakness, and I think it does still have the same ability. Strength drain, 2d6 plus 2 necrotic damage. Target strength score is reduced by a d4. Uh, they fall unconscious if their strength is reduced to 0. Uh, I, I think that's the difference. Is a typical shadow strength drain kills them if they drop their strength to 0. This one makes them fall unconscious. Otherwise, the reduction lasts until they finish a short or long rest. And again, it's a fey creature as opposed to, I believe, undead. Uh, Sir Talavar is an interesting looking character with some unique art that we'll have to go take a look at. He is sort of a purple fairy dragon with a mustache and a sword. Um, I liked him. <laughs> I'm glad you like it, bud. Uh, Sir Talavar is an esteemed member of the Seelie Court and a loyal vassal of the Summer Queen. Many of Sir Talavar's uh, squires have gone on to become knights of great renown. The venerable fairy dragon has an encouraging can-do demeanor and an unwavering sense of honor. Um, and then again, we have a bunch about role-playing them, but here's a tiny fairy dragon. Uh, has superior invisibility. Uh, turn invisible as a bonus action until his concentration ends. Uh, limited telepathy, out to 60 feet. I communicate with any other fairy dragon. Magic resistance. Some innate spellcasting, again, as tied to a fairy dragon, as we can see here. Red is dancing lights, mage hand, minor illusion. Orange is color spray. Yellow is mirror image. Green suggestion. Blue major image, indigo hallucinatory terrain, and then ultimately violet uh, fairy dragons get polymorph. He does have a plus one tiny sword that does a d4 plus six piercing damage, a bite attack that does a piercing damage, and then again a fairy dragon's typical euphoria breath attack with, where again, a DC uh, 11 wisdom saving throw. A very interesting piece of artwork and a very interesting character. Uh, definitely could have a lot of fun supplanting him in other campaigns as well. All right, moving on from Sir Talavar, Scabatha Nightshade, we covered already. I think Skilla was covered under the League of Malevolence. Uh, we have Squirt, the oil can, again, dipping very heavily into um, the Wizard of Oz vibes here. Uh, Squirt is a tiny construct here. 
uh, with poison immunity, immunity to exhaustion, paralyzed, poison, and unconscious. Uh, again, false appearance looks like an oil can. Uh, doesn't need to eat air. Doesn't need air, food, drink, or sleep, as it's literally an animated oil can. Has a slam attack that, for surprisingly, for being a tiny construct, does a D4 plus to bludgeoning damage, and then also has three applications of boggle oil. Uh, Squirt expends one application of boggle oil to create a 10-foot square puddle of slippery, non-flammable oil on the ground. A puddle is difficult to rain, lasts for an hour. Each creature that enters the puddle uh, must make a DC 11 dexterity saving throw or fall prone. Uh, boggles are obviously unaffected as it is boggle oil. And it says originally Squirt was a non-sentient oil can that was carried to the Feywild by dwarves hoping to harvest boggle oil. Uh, and though it was successful, the dwarves were put to sleep by pixie magic, and during a celebration that erupted around them, an elf used her magic to animate the oil can, and now we have Squirt, the animated oil can. Uh, and then, let's see, Strongheart we've already covered. Moving on to the final page of monsters from Wild Beyond the Witchlight. We have a swarm of campestries. So we've already covered the campestry before. This is a swarm of them, so challenge rating one. Uh, bludgeoning, piercing, slashing, resistance, which is standard for uh, a swarm as well as the condition immunity, same tremor sense, same mimicry, but has the swarm ability here, right? Can occupy creature space. Uh, it does have its headbutt attack, which is obviously significantly more improved as it's a swarm, doing 44 plus bludgeoning, uh, 44 bludgeoning damage or 2d4 if it has half hit points. And then once again, has the spore business, uh, ability of a campestry. Uh, closing that out, we have the Tin Soldier, which is a small, uh, kind of again, another construct, an animated Tin Soldier that you can see here. Uh, again, construct style immunities, poison, psychic, and most of the conditions. Blind sight out to 60 feet. Uh, Anti-magic susceptibility though, it is incapacitated in an area of an anti-magic field. Uh, if targeted by dispel magic, it must succeed on a constitution saving throw uh, or fall unconscious for a minute. I will use this as an opportunity to once again reiterate how dispel magic doesn't normally stop things like constructs unless it's specifically called out just like how a construct and things like that might not necessarily fall uh, out of, would not stop working in an anti-magic field. Again, this specifically states that it does, so therefore it does, uh, has false appearance, and then a two slam attacks uh, as part of his multi-attack to a d6 plus two bludgeoning damage. Moving on, we have a treant sapling. So again, we have treants in the monster manual. We have a treant sapling here. As you can see, there's some pretty cool, unique art of it playing with the squirrel. Uh, and again, vulnerability to fire, resistance to bludgeoning and piercing damage, false appearance, it looks like a tree. It makes two slam attacks. The slam attacks do a d10 plus three bludgeoning. It can throw a rock for two d10 plus three bludgeoning and can also animate trees, uh, which again, similar to a standard treant, although this one happens to only be a challenge rating two as compared to the original treant. Um, let's see, it can animate one or two trees. And then we have a tree blight, which was contained in Curse of Strahd. Warduke, we already covered. We have a Will-O-Wisp variant here. Let's take a look at what's going on here. Looks to be mostly the same, but we might have to do a quick duplication and pull up the standard Will-O-Wisp so we can see uh, what the differences are between the two. They are both still considered undead. Um, they have the same fly speed and abilities there, same resistances. So the Wild Beyond the Witchlight one has Consume light as a, uh, Life as a bonus action. It can target one creature uh, within five feet that has zero hit points and is still alive. Uh, the target must succeed on a DC 10 con save uh, against this magic uh, or die, and then it gets 3d6 hit points. That is the same. Uh, it can't wear or carry anything. It can move incorporeal movement, variable illumination. Mm -hmm. It does a shock that does 2d8 lightning damage. It can turn invisible. And then this one has Magic Boon, which, okay, that's the new, the new thing. Uh, in a short or long rest, it grants a boon to one creature it can see within five feet that isn't undead. The boon's recipient gains a D4 and can at any time within the next 24 hours roll this die and add the number roll to one ability check, attack, roll, or saving throw. No creature can have more than one of these boons at a given time. And then I think we've got the Witchlight Hand, which is just a simple NPC, someone that works at the Witchlight Carnival. Uh, again, a challenge rating 1-8. has secret expertise. They get one additional, uh, has one additional skills of the list right here. Has a dagger attack. Has pixie dust. Sprinkles a pinch of pixie dust on itself or another creature. And then they gain the benefits of the pixie dust, which gives them a fly speed of 30 feet for a minute. 
and then has dancing lights message or prestidigitation as their spells. We have a small version of a witch light hand. That was a medium sized witch light hand. This is a small version. Doesn't really look like it has any real differences as far as I can tell. Uh, just is a smaller size, so you can choose what um, what type of race you want the creature to be. And then I believe Zarak and Zargash were both contained within our NPC video. So there you go. That is the end of the monster coverage here uh, from Wild Beyond the Witchlight. Again, I'm very glad that I chose to do it this way because there were several really interesting, unique creatures that were not contained in the back. For example, probably one that would be uh, I would say arguably more useful for a lot of folks if you want to do something like throw a treant sapling at someone. You don't want to necessarily in involve a full-blown treant because that might be too powerful, but a challenge rating two treant sapling could be useful. Again, that is not something contained in the creature section in the back of Wild Beyond the Witchlight, but if you flip through the adventure, you might have missed it. So I wanted to catalog all of these here so that you know if you happen to pick up the book and you're like, oh, Ted mentioned there was a treant sapling. I didn't see it. Oh, you have to go flip through the book and find it. Now, again, if you happen to have it on D&D &D Beyond, when you click on the View uh, Details page, it does tell you what page to find it on. For example, the trans sapling is found on page 36. Um, but anyway, so there you go, folks. That is the, uh, the final bit of coverage that I'll be doing for Wild Beyond the Witchlight before we start diving into Fizzband's Treasury of Dragons coverage very shortly. So I wanted to say thank you very much for watching. Thank you again to my patrons over on Patreon for continuing to support me and the channel. And thank you to my little buddy for holding out for the rest of this video. I will see you all next time.